Hi everyone, welcome back to Vedic Life Coaching. Thank you so much for joining me and welcome back to the Troubleshooting Series. Today we're going to take a look at the moon and I'm going to take you through my top five remedies to help improve moon energy in your life. So where have we come from in this series? Well, we've come from the outer rim. We've had a look at Saturn. We've had a look at Jupiter, Mars. We're now here with the Earth. We're going to look at the moon before we head into the inner rim planets and that is Venus, Mercury and the Sun. And we will look at Rahu Ketu axis as well and possibly a couple of other bits also. So it's a jam-packed series, this one. Now, before I get into talking about what are the signs to look out for for a strong moon or a weak moon, I thought I would tackle a comment that has come from a rather enthusiastic viewer of the channel. Uh, this particular viewer has left many comments and I just thought I would address them all at once here today because we are talking about moon today and the next one I record is going to be Venus as well. Now I refer to both of these energies as female or feminine energies. That's how I have come to know them, that's how I use them in practice. That's how, you know, when I'm with a client today, I was actually with a client in person, it was fantastic. Um, I did do a, a session at Macquarie Uni, it was really great. And, um, you know, when I'm with a person and I'm looking at their chart and I'm looking at Moon and Venus, I am looking at feminine female energies, the female energies in that person's life, whether you're a man or a woman, it doesn't matter. Okay, so we've got the moon is the mother, right? Sun is the father. Moon is the queen. Sun is the king. Okay, Venus to me is very much about relationships. It's about love. And for me, it's very much a female feminine energy. That is how I read it. And through practice, through studying so many charts and doing quite a bit of work now in this field, that, that is how they are to me. Um, I also wanted to say that I think it's perfectly fine to leverage the wisdom of Western astrology. Western astrology, the Greek system, has enormous value and I have studied that system as well. And they do refer to those two as female feminine energies. And that really works in my practice because for me, the way I use astrology is it is you know, my tool of choice. But I also do use a little bit of human design uh, when I'm working with someone. I also am going to be using Maya Briggs as well, which I'm very excited to incorporate into my work. So for me, I use these tools, but the goal of what I'm doing is to help you to get clarity in your own life. And when you get that clarity, you can get relief, you can get understanding, you can feel freer, you can feel excited to go after your gifts and strengths and build your world, you know, and, and that is what I'm all about. I'm not so much about, you know, being a historian or, uh, you know, and, and look, believe me, I, I totally love and, and respect the Vedic system. And this is an observation that my mum made actually, which was really good. She said to me that you practice Vedic astrology in a secular way. And I loved that. She absolutely just hit the nail on the head there because that is what I'm doing. Recently, I was consulting someone about their wedding date. They wanted to set a wedding date. They asked me, when should we do that? And so I looked up the dates and of course I knew that, okay, don't do this during Shraad. And I was saying to my mum, this is how the whole secular thing came up because I said to my mum, should I be bringing up Shraad dates on my channel? Is that something that I should be doing? You know, because sometimes, you know, I've, it's always wonderful working with my mother. If you were to see my chart, you would see that she's an excellent career advisor for me. She always has been. And anyway, we're discussing this and she said to me, no, no, you don't need to do that. She said, you practice Vedic astrology in a secular way. It's the modern way. It's perfectly fine. And yeah, I, I do think so, you know, but of course, when there's a need, I will be. Uh, you know, talking about Chandra, the moon god, you know, the Hindu god of the moon, and I will be talking about Shukra. Actually, if you look at this link above, there's a master's episode which features Shukra, and you'll actually be able to see some video footage of Shukra, okay? So, so I, I'm pro all of this stuff, and I'm really into it all. But at the same time, you know, uh, to serve a modern audience, I think 
it's perfectly fine and it's perfectly fine oh, another thing I do as well you'll hear me when I'm talking sometimes I'll say well this planet is in trine to that there's a square happening I'll talk about a square you know um, because I do have a lot of Western astrology people who are here as well. So I'm trying to serve many audiences and yeah, I'll just keep doing that. So I do hope that that uh, sorts that out. Let's get on with the show. Let's have a look there. Okay, six minutes, that's not too bad. Right, let's take a look at the moon. So now, is your moon too strong? This is what we're going to take a look at. How do you know? Now, if I was to look at your chart, I would be looking for, I would be looking for, you know, for example, something like moon in Taurus in the fourth house, something like that. Uh, moon in Cancer is quite good. Um, I've got Rumi's chart. We'll be talking about Rumi later in this episode. He's got a beautiful moon in Cancer in the second house. That's stunning. You know, they had a very strong moon. But if you're not familiar with your chart, but you are a keen observer of life, you'll be able to figure out a full moon, a very strong moon. You, I don't know if you'll be able to figure out a full moon necessarily, but you'll be able to pick a strong moon by these symptoms. So what are the symptoms of a moon being too strong? Okay, we've got overgiving. This person will give and give and give. Okay, they love to give. They need to give. If you go around to their house, they will feed you. They will really feed you. Like they will overfeed you they will, and they'll have everything and they'll give you everything. And they'll be like, are you sure you've had enough? Come on, have some more. I can see you. I know, I know you didn't need enough. They're going to do all of that, right? They are going to overgive. They're going to give you far too much. And of course, anyone from, you know, Indian culture, but any ethnic culture, right? Or any kind of culture where, you know, people are just, tight knit even like you know up north in England and stuff like that people just they give they just over give they just want to give right so it's something of certain cultures as well where you just find people are so giving another thing that moon when it's far too strong may do is they might overshare okay and this is a good one to spot in a workplace of course when you're in a workplace you know when you're one-on-one -on -one with people it's fine to overshare you make friends, you end up telling your life story. Of course you do that. But when you're in a great big meeting and absolutely everyone's present, you know, sometimes a moon that's far too strong may overshare in inappropriate circumstances. I know of someone who's got a really strong moon. She overshared way too much in an interview one time. And yeah, she didn't get the job. So, you know, that, that is a possibility there, right? Uh, overprotective. Being overprotective this is something that a moon that is really strong might do. You know, we've got Cancer the Crab, and there's this kind of, I've got this kind of clutching sort of, yeah, I want you, like it's kind of that kind of energy is here, right? It can be a bit possessive, it can be a bit, you know, um, yeah, it, it, a little bit possessive possibly, or, you know, you're only mine, and a little bit of that. A moon that's very strong, very loving, right? But some, sometimes giving too much, that's, that's possible. Uh, another thing you will find with these people is that receptivity is very high. Okay, the highly receptive people so probably have a good intuition as well. Um, now, some of the bad things about moon being too strong, one of them could be that a person could control the other by loving too much. So this could be a person who is like, oh, well, I've given you so much. I've given you so much. I've given you way more than you've given me. So now I want to control you or something along those lines, right? That can be a possibility here. Another thing is that a person might feel suffocated. Yeah, that, that is a possibility. You could just, and, and you can see that with cultures as well. Sometimes with the Western culture, you know, things, there's more freedom. You know, there's, there's more flexibility, there's more freedom. Sometimes they can go to a, a strong, uh, you know, multicultural, ethnic culture or whatever, and, and they, can be like wow this is really loving and they might love it for a bit but then equally it might it might get suffocating or something along those lines each culture has got great things right about it okay and it's all about finding balance now there's attachment energy is here as well so moon loves anyway the moon will always love you anyway because what's that it's your mother okay the mother always loved you anyway when you're a baby 
you know, you might bite her or you might throw up on her or you might, you know, if you're having a bad hair day, she doesn't care. She loves you. She loves you, looks after you, does everything for you, right? So the moon loves anyway. That is a strong feature of the moon. Uh, this can be a bad thing because the moon that loves anyway can keep you in a bad relationship or in an unsuitable relationship. Now what's going to get you out of that relationship? It's going to be Venus. Venus is the one that sets the worth. Venus is an evaluative energy that will evaluate and say, well, come on, you're just getting breadcrumbs from this one. Get out of there. You're worth more than that. It's that kind of Venus will get you out. But if you've got a strong moon, you'll love anyway. You, you can't help it. You want that thing, even though it's irrational and possibly wrong for you and whatever, right? You want it. You want it just because you want it. You know, it, it's that kind of energy. So what about if your moon is weak? Let's take a look at this. So if your moon is weak, you might find that you hide from life. Sorry about that. Uh, if your moon is weak, you might find that you hide from life, you hide from love, okay? Um, these people can be enormously shy. I find it very difficult to uh, express emotions, okay? You can have a lot of hidden emotions here. Because we're in, let's say if we're looking at the fourth house, for example, it's a hidden place. Um, so there can be a lot of unexpressed emotion happens with a weak moon and that can lead to you missing out on relationships or not going for the thing you really want or whatever that is. Um, the mind might control the heart. This is a possibility as well with a weak moon. If your moon is not very strong, um, your mind can really take over. Okay, And that can lead to manipulation, control ambiguity. Uh, a weak moon might keep someone in a very ambiguous place, right? Um, so there can be a lot of fear happening. So uh, and keeping someone in an ambiguous place can be a, a control tactic as well. See, this is that whole thing, are you in control or are you in love? These, they're two very different things. You might focus too much on negative things as well if you have a weak moon. Uh, what are some astrological examples? We've got Moon in the eighth house, Moon in Scorpio. Um, you know, Moon having a, a strong Mars connection can be a bit of a thing because Mars wants to be in control. The wounded healer archetype is here, though. Okay, so if you're having some of these placements, you're like, "Oh no, this is terrible. I've got these. Don't worry." Um, the wounded healer archetype is here, and these people make brilliant psychologists, you know, good shrinks, right? Good therapists, good counselors, all that kind of thing. So please don't worry if you have a weak moon. Any of these things that are weak or challenging, it's our job to come here and turn it around, right? That's what it's all about. So let's take a look at top tip number one. Top tip number one is nourish yourself. Now I say this to a lot of my clients. This is a big thing that comes up. Uh, if I see a moon that is challenged or in a difficult spot, I will always try to say to that person, can you get really good at nourishing yourself? Okay. Um, you might have also suffered at the hands of parents who didn't nourish you fully. That is a strong possibility. Okay. That and, you know, with the amount of self-development work and awareness that's rising on the planet at the moment, a lot of people are identifying that, yeah, hang on a minute, I, I wasn't supported when I needed it. You know, and, and this is not at the hands of bad parents. A lot of times parents are very good, but the more self-development work you do, you might discover gaps or you might discover, oh, hang on a minute, yeah, I was a bit neglected or, you know, yeah, that, that wasn't right. Or, you know, you start to become aware of some of these things. And sometimes, you know, that can lead to resentment towards certain people and things like that. So as you grow spiritually, be aware of that. Uh, you, you will come across times where you're like, wow, yeah, that, that, that was not right. But it, that shouldn't give you an excuse to lash out, okay, because it happened a long time ago. The idea is, and we, we're going to talk about forgiveness. Forgiveness is an interesting one, and I do have that. I've got some notes about that for Mercury, so stay tuned for the Mercury episode. I haven't got forgiveness in here, but it would be good to forgive, right? And a good thing to do would be to learn to nourish yourself, learn to parent yourself, learn to fill those gaps. Anything that was missing, do it for yourself. Love yourself, okay? Um, that, that is really the, the solution there. 
And I've got the note here, especially if you want to evolve beyond what your parents created or whatever they did, which I, I think is a very natural um, goal or ambition of people. They want to, they want to go beyond whatever, whatever the parents did. It's like, okay, they did that. How can I go beyond that? And very often in that instance, you are going to need coaches or guides or different people. Top tip number two, dissolve all pointers. This is a good one for the moon, okay? The moon, the moon, the mind, the moods, the emotions, the tides that move, right? What are these pointers? Okay, so Eckhart Tolle once said, the finger that points to the moon is not the moon, right? They're two different things. So what is he talking about here when he says the point at the finger that points to the moon? He is talking about language. He's talking about words, really. He's talking about, you know, so the word moon is a pointer to the moon, but it is not the moon. I like to do this with a tree. It's better with a tree. So if you look at a tree, there's a tree in front of you, and I call the word tree. It's a tree, but that's just a word. That's just a sound I'm making. That's just a little descriptor. But you could use many other descriptors as well. You could call it a living being. You know, you could call it a pine tree. So you're getting more specific. There's a gum tree over there. Two very different trees, right? But what the ego does and what the mind does is it just goes, that's a tree. And then it just doesn't think about it. And it happily cuts it down and puts up a shopping mall or something, right? So. We're losing touch with reality. We're losing touch with the now. We're not connecting with all the living beings that are around us. You know, that's a, that's a living being. We don't call it that. We just call it a tree. And that's a little shorthand thing that we take for granted and becomes unimportant and, you know, we move on. We don't actually connect with anything anymore, right? Because we're stuck with all these pointers or street signs. Okay, I like using the street sign thing as well, or signpost. This is all Eckhart Tolle, this is all his work. But he's big on you know, meditation, being in the now, dissolving the pointers, dissolving the thoughts. And that gets you back into the heart and it gets you back experiencing life, right? And experiencing the now and experiencing the, the living flames of life that are all around us. So see, when I think about street signs, I think about the top corner over there, pole with a sign which is my actual street where I am but that's just a word and when I think about the street but see being here is so different being here is so different to thinking about the label experiencing this place has all these memories and feelings and you know when I've been away for a long time and I'm coming back here in the car or whatever it is like so all these feelings come, it's, it's, it can be nice, it can be challenging, it can be difficult, it can be all kinds of things. And those are the tides, that's the water, right? So, yeah, we need to dissolve the pointers and experience just being the water, you know, being connected. I've got the note here, when you dissolve the pointers, you experience life. And experience is about feeling the movement, the ups and the downs, the tides, how we flow with life, and just being with that, not judging it. You know, sometimes it's a peaceful lake, sometimes we've got waves crashing, you know. And I, I suppose when their waves are crashing, that's when we get scared and we, we escape into our pointers, we escape into our thoughts. So dissolve the pointers and be with the movement, be with the feeling. Top tip three, become irrational. I like this one. I think this is a good one for the moon. Become irrational. Rumi once said, sell your cleverness and buy bewilderment. Now Rumi was amazing at using pointers in an artful and stylish way. He would use all the pointers and take you to this place of love and you just get suspended in a world of love. It was amazing what he's able to do with words. And if we look at his chart, you'll be able to see, as I mentioned earlier, we've got him as a 
uh, very strong moon look at this he this guy knows love so we've got here moon in cancer in the second house in d9 and we've got virgo moon so internally he's got this strong moon that loves right really really very loving moon that i want you energy and i'm having you kind of thing i don't care where you are but i want you um so there's that but then if we look at the d1 chart the life path what's this person doing you know we've got him as i've got him at 12 p.m but we'll just look at the fact that he's a virgo moon so the life path had him writing an expertly kind of dissecting uh, and, and using pointers in an artful way but we can see where the emotion is coming from it's really coming from that d9 chart of his it's really beautiful so Rumi used to used to say things like yes yeah, sell your cleverness and buy bewilderment sell your cleverness becoming irrational do you know one time this is all reminding me as well of one time this was a while ago I had a compliment come from this guy at work whatever anyway he said um, it was a confusing compliment and here's here's why he said to me for a woman you're actually quite rational and it was a compliment I could detect a compliment I was like yeah this is a compliment isn't it but then I'm also going hang on a minute but he's putting down all of womankind I'm like I can't, I'm not happy with this what is this and if I wasn't quick or smart enough to speak up or say anything or I just kind of took the compliment and carried on but then but I've reflected on it since and I'm like hang on a minute no, that's not right something's wrong there yeah so see this is the thing female energy it is irrational right so that it's an interesting compliment yeah look at that for a woman you're actually quite rational see there's some some weird precision in there even though I was offended I was I promise I was offended on behalf of all of mankind because I'm like hang on a minute you can't say that but there, there was truth in there as well I'm now seeing that so anyway poets will use many words to describe what falling in love is like you know they'll use many words but it never uh, does it does it always encapsulate the experience it can't the experience is, is a separate different thing and that's a heart energy and it's a feminine energy and it's a words can't describe it kind of a thing right i've got here the realm of moon and venus this is love this is the space of the heart this is feminine energy this is and i'm reading neville goddard at the moment he's really interesting because he talks about the fact that i think does he say that the feminine energy is subconscious look at that subconscious subconscious is is irrational isn't it you know there's no logic and that's where you see Rumi is a good chart to have here because he had logic uh, and rationality in that D1 chart of his but equally he could just be totally suspended in love you know he, he has quite a, a blend actually so it's so it's really nice to, to look at his chart I've got the note here uh, it is irrational yeah the moon energy is irrational and I have the note here allow your feelings to dominate you once in a while you don't have to do it all the time just practice just just be with the feelings just be with them and that's what meditation is that's what we're doing we're allowing thoughts to come and go like clouds and we're just being with whatever feelings are there in the present moment top tip four return to self when we're in the feminine energies or we're very much in love or we're very focused on another person we can forget ourselves we can forget to look after ourselves we can forget to you know i don't know get a glass of water or eat on time or sleep when you have to or you know basic things sometimes get missed so this thing of you know one mustn't abandon themselves self-abandonment this is this is big work that we all do because everybody does the one seven axis because everyone's got an ascendant you know in the first house we all have to deal with other people right so these are very important lessons i've got the note here stay on your side of the tennis net that's a very jerry wise concept i've often referred people to go to him if you need to do any self-abandonment work or um, you know even narcissist empath we'll talk about that in the next point but yeah stay on your side of the tennis net uh, if things aren't going so well in any relationship 
don't abandon yourself. And I've got here, return to your shore, build your castle. Okay, um, and this comes from a concept by Khalil Gibran. I wasn't able, I didn't have time to look up his chart, but let's have this quote because I think this is really appropriate here. He says, and I'll quote, let there be spaces in your togetherness and let the winds of the heavens dance between you. Love one another, but make not a bond of love. Let it rather be a moving sea between the shores of your souls. I really like that just for, you know, this concept of return to self, be on your shore, you know, don't, um, and, and build, build your castle. He's also got the quote here as well, fill each other's cup, but drink not from one cup. I think that's really good too. Yeah, and the next final tip, top tip five, don't label, just study. All right, what is this thing about labels? So this is the realm of psychology. Psychology is absolutely brilliant at accurately diagnosing and labeling uh, different people, different dynamics, different conditions. It's incredible, right? So I studied quite a lot the narcissist empath dynamic, right? I've studied that heaps. And it's pretty amazing some of the things that they define it. It's quite a large world, actually. Um, and it goes beyond just the meaning of those two words individually. There's a lot to that whole thing. I've got the note here, study the art of great manipulators. So yes, that's narcissist empath. Study it, learn what this is. Because especially if you're more of an empathic person, more of an introvert, more of an intuitive person, you wouldn't dream of doing some of the things that a narcissist might do, right? But it's important to know what they might do so you can protect yourself. Okay, moon, we've got crab energy here, protection. Okay, so it is important to study what people could do so that you protect yourself. I, I think that's a good thing to do. Um, I've got the note here, study the narcissist empath dynamic. My favorite teachers are, so number one, Sam Vaknin, he's great. Especially those episodes where he gets a glass of red wine and starts drinking. You always know when you're in good hands, when you shrink, you know, it cracks open the booze, right? You, 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 with the true professional there. No, he's really good, he's, he is really good. I like him, I've learned so much from him. Dr. Ramani, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Jerry Wise, brilliant, and Common Ego, that was what, I, I watched that channel quite a bit, this was, um, I can't remember when, I think it was last year or the other year before, really good, really good content on there. I have the note here, study the games that people play so you can protect yourself, but do not label or dissect someone else. Very hard to do, very, very hard to do, because when we start to get a bit of knowledge, we like to use it, and uh, believe me, I know, because I, do all these things and I make all the mistakes and uh, yeah um, but yeah I mean that's it's, 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 it's labeled people and you know dissected people is a terrible thing to do it's, it's just yeah we mustn't do that uh, I think it was Krishnamurti who said and I've quoted this one a couple of times I'm going to try and drag this one out of my head something like observation without evaluation is the highest form of intelligence and that is very true so can we observe can we see the truth of what's going on without, without it putting us off center or shaking us inside or rattling our own cage. Like, can, can, we, can we look? Can we see the truth? Can we, just, can we just be with it? And not label, not, you know. But equally, it's, it's good to study the labels. So there's a lot of value in studying the realm of psychiatry and self-development and personal healing and growth and all that, great to study all this. But equally, we don't need to label, we don't need to put a label. It's just for seeing and understanding, you know. Um, yeah, I've got the note here, you can create a boundary and kind of be like a bubble of air, but that, that, that bubble of it, that breaks and we all, we all return back to the, back to the water. And it's that Bruce Lee thing. I think he said, be like water. And he was right, definitely. Be like water. Be like, be like the, one, the one energy that we all are, you know. 
that is what it's all about. So guys, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Please let me know how you got on in the comments below. I realize this episode is quite a little bit longer than the others. It's the moon, right? The moon gives and gives and gives. So this is a really long episode. Oh, this has worked out quite well. Venus might be long too. Let's spend some time with Venus. I think that's going to be a fun one. I've half written it. I haven't got all the notes, but it, it's coming along. So, and I might post that next week now because I was supposed to do two this week, but things overran uh, on other things I've been doing. So might just be one this week, but thank you so much for watching and I look forward to seeing you next time.